Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 21st of January and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 24th of January. Uh, before we look ahead to the upcoming week's events, and certainly there's quite a few of them, the Fed meeting being a particular case in point, um, as well as tech earnings from the likes of Apple, Tesla and Microsoft. Um, this week's market events, obviously, I think do merit some comment because once again, we're seeing much more weakness in US markets than we're currently seeing in Europe. Um, certainly, the FTSE 100 is continuing to outperform, which suggests that perhaps maybe the growth story is starting to become um, the choice of trade rather than the value trade, which is starting to come under increasing pressure. I think the big question at the moment is the decline is whether the declines that we're seeing in US markets are the beginnings of a much broader correction going forward. Certainly some of the more noteworthy declines that we've seen this week, um, like Peloton, for example, where the wheels have literally come off, the not only the wheels, the chain and everything else. Um, as lockdown stocks or lockdown winners start to become reopening losers, even Netflix um, some posted some fairly decent Q4 numbers, but their guidance for Q1 was fairly disappointing. We've seen Goldman Sachs report again record breaking numbers this week, and yet their shares slumped massively in the aftermath of those earnings by as much as 8%. Certainly, US bank earnings have been by and large fairly positive. But it's the guidance more than anything that is starting to weigh on US equity markets more broadly. U European markets have been much more resilient. We've seen some technical breakdowns in the likes of the NASDAQ. We can see that on this chart here. We've broken below that 15,500 level in the past few days. Um, and we've broken below the 200 day moving average, which suggests that we could well retest the October lows on the NASDAQ. Um, the mere fact that on Thursday, the NASDAQ was up over 2% at one point and actually closed down 2% is not a very good sign. It's a very bad sign. The inability to hold on to those highs that we saw yesterday suggests that perhaps we're changing mindset in terms of US markets and we're no longer in buy the dip mode. We're now looking and sell the rally. Now, of course, whether or not that mindset um, is applicable to European markets it is another question entirely. And I think this divergence or this US exceptionalism, if you like, could well be behind us. And now we've got to be much more critical in our thinking when it comes to um, looking at US markets and then extrapolating that into European markets. Essentially, once again, we're in that mindset of you need to trade what you see. Um, certainly, I think the NASDAQ has broken down and while we're below 15,500, the buy the dip mentality needs to be adapted to potentially sell the rally while we're below this particular level here. Now, I would, ha would hazard a word of warning here, even though we've seen a technical breakdown in the NASDAQ, we haven't actually seen it in the S&P 500. Now that could change. We're right on the 200 day moving average at this point in time. So how the market reacts around this particular level, 4,480, the fact that we've broken below it would suggest to me that perhaps we are at a very critical juncture for the S&P 500. And as such, we could potentially head back to the October lows of around about 4,270. So how markets react on the S&P 500 is going to be very, very crucial over the course of the next few days. But certainly there is a perception perhaps that we are starting to see the beginnings of a little bit of a rollover or a consolidation phase for US markets. Let's quickly look at the Dow. Um, and the Dow has also broken below 
the 200 day moving average. So we've had two US major benchmarks close below their 200 day moving averages. Now, obviously the Dow has done that before. So we need to be a little bit too, a little bit careful about extrapolating too much from that. But certainly I think if we don't, if we take out this 34,000 level and this series of lows through here, then the Dow could also be in a little bit of trouble as well. So paying particular attention to US markets. I think what's also important this week is that we saw US Treasury yields um, move to their highest levels um, in quite some time. That for me, around about 1.9%, that was particularly um, important. But what was also, I think, particularly noteworthy was its inability to move beyond that and actually we are now back below 1.8 percent um, we filled the gap that we saw at the start of this week um, which is obviously a shorter week for us investors because of the martin luther king holiday on monday we gapped higher we went to 1.9 percent but we came back just as sharply and now we're back below 1.8 percent so in technical analysis parlance is what we've seen here a potential island reversal on US 10 year yields? Because even though we've fallen back and inflation risks continue to rise, maybe we're starting to get a little bit of haven buying in US treasuries as equity markets, US equity markets in particular, start to roll over. Um, is, there, is there more money to be made in US treasuries um, ahead of obviously the Fed meeting next week? Perhaps there's a reluctance to sell off US Treasuries too aggressively ahead of next week's Fed meeting. So I think there could be an element of position adjustments. I think there's definitely going to be an element of position adjustments heading into next week's meeting because we've not only got that, we've got fourth quarter, US fourth quarter GDP, um, as well as US PCE deflator, which is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. And if I cast your mind back to just over a week ago, US CPI came in at its highest level since 1983 at 7%. Um, that's still well above EU CPI for December, which was confirmed at 5% this week. Um, and that's a record high for EU CPI. German inflation confirmed at 5.3%, the highest level since 1992. But one particular piece of data that did catch my eye, which may have got lost in all of the noise of this week was a German PPI for December, which rose from 19% year on year to 24.2%. And the month on month number, the month on month number, and I get this, we're expecting a number of 0.9 came in at 5%, 5%. Think about that for a minute. I mean, 5% would be a number, not, you know, even a big number for a year on year number, but it came in at 5% month on month, German PPI for December. And yet, Christine Lagarde at the ECB insists that inflation is likely to be transitory and that the ECB won't be raising rates this year at all. Well, good luck with selling that narrative to um, the new Bundesbank president, because I'll tell you, I don't think that's going to go down um, too well. So I think the ECB is going to be particularly interesting as we look ahead towards the next two to three weeks because we've got an ECB meeting coming up over the next couple of weeks and we've also got a Bank of England meeting coming up and the likelihood is that we will see a rate rise in February from the Bank of England of 0.25% in response to those CPI numbers of 5.4% that we saw this week and RPI which came in at 7.5%. So inflation definitely an issue going forward and certainly I think as we head towards um, February and March, central banks have got a tricky balancing act of tightening into a slowing economy, a rising inflation um, narrative, and it's going to be very difficult to see how they spin that narrative, which brings me neatly on to um, this week's Fed rate meeting. Now, look at, looking at this chart here would appear to suggest that perhaps in the short to medium term, we may have seen the top in uh, the move higher in US Treasury yields. You know, how much can the Fed really tighten? There's been an awful lot of discussion as we head into 
this week's meeting as to how how they're going to frame the narrative ahead of uh, a March rate hike, because essentially I think the March rate hike is pretty much priced in. It's really how they frame the narrative. And we've heard an awful lot of chatter this week that we could see four rate rises this year, five. I've even heard in some quarters, you know, the Fed is so far behind the curve, it may have to hike rates seven times this year. Well, you know, I mean, that's just a nonsense argument. Having said that, what they could do is raise, there's been a bigger discussion about a 50 basis point rate hike um, at some point this year. There's been a discussion about balance sheet reduction. Now, I don't for one moment think that the Fed is going to talk about raising rates by 50 basis points in March. They're still um, adding to the balance sheet. Um, so to go from adding to the balance sheet to raising rates by 50 basis points in March, I don't see how they can do that unless they reframe the narrative at uh, next week's meeting. And it would be a significant vault face if they were to do that. But it certainly, I, yeah, and I think it would certainly have the capacity to catch markets on the hop. But having said that, when you've got inflation at 7%, why would you not call an end to quantitative easing perhaps four or five weeks earlier? Or would you let it run its course? So there is, there is, I suppose, merit in having the discussion as to whether or not they call time on QE next week. But, you know, what, what's, what's the upside to doing that? Why not let's just let it run for an extra few weeks? If you do terminate QE next week, are you then admitting that perhaps your tapering timeline was a mistake, that you're behind the curve massively, and as such, you're panicking, and therefore you need to take remedial action sooner rather than later? Is that a narrative that they want to be basically adopting? You know, it's a, it's a difficult balancing act. So I think the Fed has always been very measured in its responses and it's always projected forward quite significantly in advance in order to avoid the type of um, policy surprises that um, we saw from the Bank of England in November and December. You know, the Fed has always been fairly clear on its communications policy and they tend to project by a forward guidance, not by reacting on policy. So I think we could get much more aggressive guidance next week, while at the same time adopting, you know, not changing policy and projecting forward as to whether or not we'll get a 25 basis point rate hike in March and whether or not we get a very significant discussion on quantitative tightening, i.e. balance sheet reduction. Will they set out a timeline for that? And I think that will be more than anything how the, the, the debate is framed. Not any significant change in policy now, but how they set out their projections for potential rate rises. And at the moment, there's three in the dot plots for this year. And how they frame the debate around balance sheet reduction. And I think that's where the main policy debate will be around and how the discussion will be framed going forward. Um, whether or not that drives yields higher, it's hard to say. But certainly looking at this year, there does appear to be some evidence that shorter term yields may have gone as far as they can for the time being. And certainly if you look at where they were, say for example, pre-pandemic, they're still below the levels that they were at the beginning of 2020. So, um, you know, we've come a long way, but we're still below the levels that we were, say for example, um, before the pandemic kicked off. So looking at the dollar index, we can see that we've seen a bit of a rebound over the course of the past few days ahead of the, ahead of the Fed meeting. And that's entirely sensible because of the fact that um, you're getting a little bit of um, position adjustment ahead of that meeting. And yes, we have broken the uptrend from the lows that we saw back in June last year. Um, but we're still above the 200 day moving average more broadly. And if you look at the dollar index in the round, um, the Fed still remains way out in front when it comes to the likelihood of rate rises coming down the pipe. The bigger question is how many we get relative to their peers. If we look at Euro dollar, for example, that has continued to break down. But crucially, 
we haven't actually broken below this trend line here. So 112.80 is going to be a very key level going forward. Need to keep an eye on that. If we break below that, then we're heading back towards 111.80 and the lows that we saw back in November. But certainly I think if the ECB hold the line that they're not going to be hiking rates this year, then it's very difficult to see any upside for euro dollar. Um, same really applies to the pound. We've broken higher. Um, the likelihood is we'll probably see the Bank of England raise rates in a couple of weeks' time. Whether that's going to be sterling supportive, that's open to debate at the moment, given um, the slowdown that we saw in December um, in the UK economy. But now that Plan B restrictions have been eased, the biggest concern now is inflation and what that does to consumer confidence and what that does to disposable incomes as we head towards April and the potential for those tax rises. So sterling has an awful lot of headwinds um, that it needs to overcome. It does appear to have found a little bit of a base in the short to medium term. The 50 day moving average is starting to roll up. So that could, if we do get a fall, um, act as a support level of around about 134.20. If we, if we drop back that low, then we should get a, a decent rebound in the value of the pound. Euro sterling, um, seen a little bit of a rebound off the lows of 83.05 earlier this week. Again, the big resistance there is 83.80. Um, as I say, seen a fairly decent reversal. We could see a little bit of period of sterling weakness taking us beyond 83.80 to 84.30. But I'm still of the opinion that euro sterling line of release resistance is for it to gradually trend lower going forward. So we've got US fourth quarter GDP on the 27th of January. That's likely to see an expansion of 5.8% annualized, slightly better than the 2.3 that we saw in Q3, although December is likely to have taken a hit um, to economic activity because of the Omicron outbreaks, which have caused staff shortages, flight cancellations, and pretty much everything else that we saw um, ripple out across the US throughout December as staff shortages caused all manner of economic problems across the US economy. Um, the PCE deflator and US consumer spending for December are also likely to be fairly key, um, uh, key, key data points, um, particularly the PCE deflator, which is the Fed's preferred sign of inflation. Um, in the space of two months, core PCE has gone from 37 to 4.7%. We could well go higher to 4.8% in December. But one thing that we have seen in the US, which we haven't, we're not currently seeing in Europe, is some sign of an easing of inflationary pressure. PPI eased actually in December from 98 to 9.7%. And US natural gas prices have been coming off um, due to um, much better supply channels in the US because of their fracking, um, which has meant that US natural gas prices are much lower than they are here in Europe. So there has certainly been an easing of inflationary pressure in the US, which we haven't actually seen here in Europe. So that's worth keeping an eye out for. Um, personal spending in the US has been strong these past few months, but this is likely to slow as it did here in the UK in December for the same reasons that we saw it slow here. So um, looking looking at the various indexes, we can, we can look at the, U, the, the, the FTSE 100. That is still holding up much better than its peers. It's still up for the year, but we are now starting to see evidence of a little bit of a rollover, which could mean that we could drift back to around about 7,400 in the short to medium term. But overall, now that we're, we're above 7,400, um, the FTSE 100 is probably likely to do better than say, for example, it's uh, continental peers, given the fact that it's lagged so much, pretty much for the last two or three years with the DAX at record highs and um, the S&P and pretty much everything else. So the DAX is heading back to its 200 day moving average. It's not really been that a significant support level over the course of the past few days. You can see the volatility that we've seen in the DAX over the past few days with very long shadows on the candles, suggesting significant amounts of volatility, big resistance of 15,900 over the course of the past couple of days. That's likely to be a, be a bit of a barrier. If we break below 15,600, then we could be having a little bit of a trip back to 15,300 
over the course of the of the next few trading sessions. But overall, being being long of European stocks is probably a safer bet at this moment in time than being long US markets going forward. So let's move on. Uh, we've got flash PMIs next week. They're likely, they're likely to paint a pretty ugly picture of December activity. So I won't spend too much time on them. Hopefully in the UK's case, there'll be a little bit of a one-off um, on an anecdotal basis. And certainly I think in terms of the hospitality sector, which took a big hit um, in December, we could see a fairly, we could, we might see a bit of a rebound um, in January and potentially in February. Obviously that will depend on how confident people feel about going back out to restaurants and pubs, given the price rises that we've, we've seen um, in headline CPI. So let's move on to earnings. Tesla, um, seen that breakdown over the course of the past few days. But one of the things that we do know is that um, they announced another record number for quarterly deliveries for their electric cars, their electric vehicles, 308,600. We've also seen Elon Musk sell 10% of his Tesla shares to pay his tax bill. So even with all of that, the shares have held up fairly well, but you still have to question whether or not they'll continue to be able to do so. Um, certainly deliver it from a delivery point of view, um, Tesla, Tesla is doing an awful lot better. Um, it produced a total of 936,172 vehicles in 2021, with the hope that um, 2022 will push that figure above the 1 million mark. Um, Musk was saying as recently as October last year that he was looking to maintain an annual growth rate of more than 50%. Profits, profits are expected to come in at a fairly healthy $2.24 a share. So big question is automotive margins, can they continue to improve? They were at 30.5% in Q3. Will he be able to maintain those margins? Um, in Q4. Certainly, I think in terms of this chart here, there is potential for a little bit more weakness, um, particularly given what we're seeing with respect to the NASDAQ. That's always assuming that you assign Tesla as being a tech stock. Big news for this week was Microsoft um, going after Activision Blizzard for $70 billion. Um, whatever your feelings about that particular acquisition, regulatory hurdles notwithstanding, Microsoft has been a beast when it comes to its earnings over the course of the past 12 months. Um, we certainly saw, and this is, this is, this is, this is going to be um, Microsoft's Q2 earnings, um, and for Q2, Microsoft expects to set a record for revenues of above $50 billion. And that will be the first time that has moved above $50 billion. Now, if you think yourself back to a year ago, um, the first quarter, it was only a year ago that they were projecting a first quarter of over $40 billion. So their revenue growth has been astro astronomical. You've got the rollout of Windows 11. You've got supply issues notwithstanding. Revenues from Office 365, which is obviously now a subscription model. You've got their Xbox revenues, or obviously Xbox Live and Xbox Gold, and an awful lot of games now, and now, or more and more games now, are becoming subscription only. So you buy the CD for 40 or 50 quid, and then that doesn't even guarantee you being allowed to play it. You then have to purchase an Xbox Live subscription for 10.99 a month um, to be able to play the game. So um, cloud segment, intelligent cloud segment, that's been growing significantly. We did see a bit of a slowdown in revenues in Q1, but they still beat expectations. So again, you know, the, the bigger question for me is, how does Microsoft see the rest of the year playing out? Profits are expected to come in at $2.32 a share. But certainly I think it could get caught up in the wider tech sell-off and we could well see a retest of the 200-day moving average, even if, the, even if the numbers be expectations. Then we've got Apple. Well, Apple appears to have broken down through its key support level. Um, it's a new fiscal year for Apple. 
um, Q, their Q1, which tends, to, which is the Thanksgiving and Christmas period, tends to be its best quarter. Um, bigger question is, will it continue to be so? In Q4, revenues fell short of expectations, coming in at $83.36 billion. Well, that's still a pretty decent number. Um, so I don't think we can be too complacent about the fact that whatever number Apple brings back for Q1, it's likely to be a decent one. Supply chain problems cost $6 billion for Apple over the last quarter. So that's likely to continue to be a drag. And if, if I need to remind you, they did cut iPhone demand in their previous quarter by 10 million units. So certainly think in terms of the services revenue, we, we need to pay particular attention to that. And they did announce a raft of new product upgrades during Q4, the newest iPhones, iPads, watches, and Macs not shipping until the end of November. So you could see a little bit of a pickup, supply chain num in supply chain constraints notwithstanding. So expecting Q1 numbers, profits coming, expected to come in at $1.89 a share. As a reminder, Apple hasn't offered any guidance since the pandemic started, hasn't stopped Wall Street projecting what that those estimates should be but irrespective of the numbers that we are expecting this week on the 27th we could struggle based on the way this chart is playing out to move significantly back to the record highs that we saw back in April and we could well see a further slide back lower and that's no reflection on Apple's numbers it's just the direction of travel at the moment for markets more broadly. Let's have a quick look at Robinhood markets. That's been an absolute disaster um, for them, given the fact that their IPO, um, they were really, really optimistic, but they've really been hammered on, on the revenue front. Um, if we look at Q3, their losses came in at $1.32 billion. And um, crypto revenue, which was a big, big earner in Q2 of this year, fell off a cliff in Q3, fell back to $51 million from $233 million in Q2. Now, at the time, the company warned that Q4 would be even worse when it comes to revenues. Their Q4 estimate for revenues is $325 million. Um, when you look at what Bitcoin's done over the course of the past few weeks, this week's numbers don't fill me with optimism. Having said that, the big question is how much of it is currently priced in, given the fact that the shares are around about $13 and they IPO'd all the way back at 38 So, you know, um, as I say, keep an eye on Robinhood. It'll be very interesting to see how the market reacts to Robinhood markets numbers when they get published on the 27th of January. So, um, We've also got Moderna coming out. I'm not. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to brush over them. If you look at Moderna's share price, that does appear to have broken down to the downside. What with the unlocking, plenty of speculation that fourth jabs may not be particularly desirable has already hit Moderna's share price going forward. And I think with all the new treatments that are coming out with with um, COVID pills, I think um, I think winter is coming for Moderna's share price, but it's still well above the levels that it was all, all that time ago back in the early years of, or the early months of 2020 and the mid months of 2020. But I certainly think winter is coming for Moderna's share price as it looks to report its Q4 numbers on the 25th of January. So going back to um, my PowerPoint slide, um, that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. Hope you all have a great weekend and uh, speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thanks very much for listening.